pleasure to introduce Neil Bazu, who is actually an uh, associate professor at the Mac campus. He uh, did his PhD uh, at McGill in the Center for Indigenous Peoples, Nutrition, and Environment, working with Lori Chan. He then went on to do an Ensign postdoc with Environment Canada and the Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, he then took up an assistant professor position at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, and recently returned to McGill in 2013. Uh, where he's cross-appointed between the Department of Natural Resource Sciences and the School of Dietetics Human Nutri and Human Nutrition. And Neil takes an ecosystem approach to community, occupational, and environmental health, and works a lot on mercury, and that's what he's going to talk about today. Good. So, Thanks, thank Reed. You know. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is an outline of my talk for today. And I'm going to start with a bit of a preamble because I think it might help provide a bit of context to the story I'd like to talk about today. So while at Michigan, I ran an exposure assessment lab for a number of years. So the idea of this lab was to help our students better understand how to gauge their own exposures to toxic chemicals. So what they would do is they would ask questions and conduct surveys to, uh, in this case it was for mercury, so they'd ask questions and conduct surveys to uh, uh, find out how much fish they were eating. Fish is a major form of mercury exposure. And then they would take a hair sample and measure mercury in the hair, and that's uh, used as a biomarker of mercury exposure. And every year we get a nice relationship like this. So the more fish you eat, the more mercury you're exposed to. But then when I did this in 2011, there was an outlier, and it was me. And it just <laughs> baffled me. Why is my hair mercury so, so high? I've been doing this for many, many years. The line is always perfect. I obviously did not make any mistakes. So what happened? And then one of my students raised her hands and said, Professor, that adventure you went on last month, what were you doing again? And that was sort of one of those moments in life where things really came together. Uh, it was a moment where I just started wondering, oh, it's real, it's real. There's pollution at the poles. And what happened a month earlier is that I was here in uh, Central East Greenland, in uh, a place near Scoresby Sun, the town. Uh, 500 people lived there. And uh, here's a satellite image taken of a schoolhouse right there in the summertime. Now, that's a station that over the last few years we've converted into uh, uh, an Arctic field site. And in fact, the group that I've been working with has been based out of this region for about 20 years. Uh, this is a picture of the station taken at nighttime, and then here's a vista from my window. So it's one of those uh, typical, beautiful, pristine Arctic environments. Uh, this is a picture of the field crew from that year. Now, we were all assembled there, like the group has been doing for many, many years, to study polar bear. Uh, polar bears, as many of you know, uh, are apex predators in the Arctic. They serve as the bellwether of the planet. So whatever's happening with polar bears gives us uh, some idea of Arctic ecosystem health and also planetary health, too. And the reason for conducting this work was really precipitated a couple decades earlier by local Inuit. And working in the Arctic is really, really critical to do work that speaks to the people that live there. And in the case of the projects in East Greenland, they were really precipitated by traditional knowledge and experiences and observations being made by Inuit from that region about the status of their environment and how things have been changing in the wildlife. So here's a picture of one of the elders speaking with uh, our field crew leader, just sort of exchanging knowledge. Now to do work in these environments, you just can't go there and do it alone, so we have to work with the Inuit. And in this case, one of the Inuits is uh, hunting. And if you look through his binoculars, you see three little polar bears. So there's a mama bear and two of her kids. Uh, we did not touch these bears. They were not shot or killed, uh, because you're not allowed to touch uh, moms and uh, their cubs in, the, in this part of the Arctic. Rather, we went for the males. And uh, on this particular trip, we uh, 10 males were hunted, and from each male we collected three or 400 samples. So it was a really intense field collection where, again, realize that these bears are normally hunted by Inuit for everything from food to shelter to clothing, so on and so forth. And we came in as scientists to very small little bits and pieces of various body parts to ask questions about the bear's health. And what made this trip really, really uh, important, unlike previous trips, is that for anyone that does molecular work here, it's not easy to do molecular work or cell biology work in the field. In this case, we took doers and doers of liquid nitrogen. So as soon as the bear was put down, all those tissues were taken immediately and frozen into minus 80, and now we've been able to use them to ask a lot of questions using molecular genetic tools. Uh, we took blood samples, and the amount of mercury in that blood is probably 10 to 100 times greater than the mercury in our 
Okay? If we had that much mercury in our bodies, we'd likely be dead. The bear's contaminated, but then bears and seals and other uh, uh, organisms in the Arctic are eaten. And in this case, we also ate polar bear meat. We ate, uh, we ate seal. And in fact, just a couple meals in East Greenland is what caused this tremendous spike in my mercury exposure. So again, it's just one of those moments where I've been reading about this for 10 years previously. I've been preaching about it, talking about it. I've never felt it. And uh, not that I can feel this change, but just seeing is believing. And it was really one of those moments where uh, uh, everything just came together. And in fact, we study mercury pollution in many parts of the world, and we've been using ourselves uh, as guinea pigs, for example. So we do work on mining populations in Africa where they burn copious amounts of mercury. And again, when we take our uh, uh, samples and measure them before and after a burning event, we see tremendous spikes as well, too. So this stuff really, really does occur. And the problem here really is there is no separation between the animals and nature. And uh, this is a long-held Aboriginal belief, and this is a belief long-held by Inuit. So this is Sheila Wakamuche, who is the president of the Inuit Circumpolar uh, Conference, uh, uh, stating quite simply that when our land and animals are poisoned, so are we. So the paradox really is, is that you have this beautiful, pristine environment, but you have residents in animals that live there that have some of the highest contaminant burdens on the planet. And the concentrations of mercury, PCBs, these new chemicals, flame retardants, fluorinated compounds, you name it, we're finding it up in the Arctic. Oftentimes, the people that live there and the animals have some of the highest levels on the planet. And what we're starting to see is that those exposures are related to uh, subclinical and even clinical changes in health. And we need to understand why and to figure out what we can do about it. So mercury is rising in the Arctic. And uh, this is a very simple uh, schematic of the mercury cycle. So much of the mercury that we find, so mercury is a naturally occurring element. We can't create it. We can't destroy it. It's always there. However, it's human activities that puts most of it into play. And in fact, anytime you burn coal, you release a little bit of mercury into the atmosphere. And if you think about society nowadays and how reliant we are upon coal, especially in China and India, where they're putting upwards of one new coal-fired power plant online every single week, there's a lot of coal being burnt, meaning there's a lot of mercury being released as well, too. It's not a chemical that stays in its backyard. So once that mercury is released into the air, it turns into a gaseous form. So this uh, uh, zero-valent form of mercury can travel long, long distances in the atmosphere. So it can actually stay in the air for upwards of a year, and it can circle the globe. Eventually that mercury comes down in precipitation events, and it can fall onto land, it can also fall onto water. And when it falls onto water, that's where something magical happens to that mercury. Bacteria get a hold of it, certain bacteria get a hold of it, and they add a carbon group to that mercury, and it gets converted into this form of mercury called organic mercury, methyl mercury. And what makes this form very, very unique, unlike the other forms of mercury, is that this form crosses biological membranes. The other forms of mercury on this uh, overhead don't cross biological membranes, but this methyl mercury form does. It can get inside of our bodies, and it can cross two really important protective barriers, the blood-brain barrier and the placental barrier. So again, once that mercury gets released, it can travel long, long distances. Uh, shaded in intense red are hot spots of mercury contamination around the world. And what happens is that it can travel with the winds. It can also travel with ocean currents, too. Uh, it travels around the world. And the fact is, once it gets closer to the Arctic, its travel starts slowing down. Because for those of you that have taken basic chemistry, you know that when things cool down, chemical reactions cool down, too. So that mercury that's released, that's there, it just does not move around as much as it does maybe in the tropics. And that's why the Arctic is often referred to as a sink for pollution. Now once it, it's there, it can readily biomagnify. So it can cross biological membranes, get inside little organisms, which are then consumed by bigger organisms, which ultimately get into people. And in fact, the concentrations of mercury we find in people and polar bears can be upwards of a million times, maybe even 10 million times greater than the levels in water or so, again, this thing is released worldwide and travel far, far distances, and once it gets into the food chain, uh, it effectively biomagnifies. 
And it's a relatively new issue. So in the last 100 years, we've seen a tremendous increase in the amount of mercury in the environment. So this is some work that we've done where we were able to get museum specimens of wildlife and human uh, heart tissue samples for since like 1200. And what we've been able to do is to show that the levels, especially in the last century, have really, really taken off. And that's not that surprising because it goes really nicely with uh, modern industrial development. So what I want to do now is to talk about some of the work we've been doing in the Arctic in terms of wildlife toxicology, and then I'll briefly mention some of the human health work we're doing because I'm transitioning more towards human health these days, and then I will make a couple concluding remarks and have two shameless plugs. So in terms of the wildlife work that we do in the Arctic, my main interest is we know that these animals are exposed to high, high levels of mercury, but we're starting to see that there can be uh, tremendous differences across species and also within species. So what's explaining why species A might be more or less sensitive than species B, but also within a species, we see great inter-individual variation in exposure. Uh, I tackle this more from a physiological or biochemical perspective, so a lot of work has been done trying to understand variation in terms of food chain transfer or geographic location or diet. Um, and those are all important. They sort of really help us understand uh, uh, differences across and within species, uh, but I feel like there are some questions we can ask uh, by using molecular and cellular approaches to understand physiological differences. So once chemicals get inside the body, we have a number of protective systems, just like polar bears and other marine mammals do, to get rid of those compounds. What we're starting to see is that those protective systems inside the body, such as glutathione or metallothionine or organic anion transporters, they can be highly variable across species. So we want a better understand if certain organisms have different uh, metabolic capacities to get rid of chemicals. And then once we're able to understand more on the exposure side, uh, a lot of the work in my lab, at least traditionally, is focused on trying to develop subclinical markers. So the idea is that these chemicals are in high concentrations and apex predators. Uh, we've seen from studies in many, many parts of the world that such exposures can be associated with adverse changes to the animals, so changes in behavior, or reproduction, or fitness, but these are things that are very difficult to measure or observe, and oftentimes when you see that, the damage is already done. So we feel like we need diagnostic indicators, so subclinical changes in, let's say, brain chemistry, some genetic pathway, which can be used to indicate or forewarn of uh, issues to come. And most of my work in the past has actually focused on mercury in terms of its neurotoxicity. So we've done a number of projects looking at changes in wildlife animal behavior, and they provide compelling evidence of harm, but they're hard, it's hard work. And in fact, if we can instead look at signaling pathways in the brain that mediate neurotransmission of things like glutamate or GABA, and use those to better understand impacts, we're hoping that that information can then translate into uh, faster, quicker, more rapid ways to assess risk. Um, and then in recent years, uh, more driven by some of the work we've been doing with humans, we've got an interest in genetic uh, sensitivities in terms of single nucleotide polymorphisms and also epigenetics, and I'll talk about that briefly. And the work that we do, I, I view it both from a basic perspective and applied perspective. So on a basic perspective, we want to better understand how these animals organisms cope with added pollution burden. And then on an applied perspective, can we use some of this knowledge to better inform uh, local communities and also decision makers on what the data means and how you can act with it. So these are the uh, organisms that we've been working with. And when I say we, uh, I don't run these projects. So I really rely upon my collaborators. And in this case, for this particular project, I've been working with a group based out of Denmark for quite a few years now. And they have a large, expansive uh, circumpolar network of wildlife biology research. And uh, my engagement with them has been in terms of these six study species. And the sample size indicated are the samples that we have in our freezers for which we can uh, uh, ask the questions we want to. So on the 2011 trip, uh, I don't get to do field work as much as I'd like to, but this is me actually, there's evidence that I'm in the field. And in fact, uh, what I'm doing right there is extracting the brain. And it was no trivial feat because we really needed power tools to get through the skull to, uh, to get into the brain. And, oh, by the way, it's minus 30 outside. So it was, I mean, it wasn't, it was tough work, but it was uh, a memorable experience. Um, 
dissected the brain into regions of physiological importance, and here's just a, um, a cross-sectional cut of the brain. So this is a polar bear brain, which doesn't look that much different than a human brain, in which we were able to uh, dissect the brain into a number of compartments or components uh, that have well-known uh, functions. And the reason we do this is because the chemicals that we study are known to affect a lot of these uh, functions, a lot of these behaviors. But again, these are things that are near impossible to study in free-ranging wildlife. So how do you know if uh, the animal is having difficulties making decisions, or how do you test the animal's IQ? These are things we cannot do with wildlife, at least in this context. Uh, so one idea is to look at the brain and regions of the brain that have control over certain functions, and then to see, are these areas where chemicals accumulate? And if they do, are we seeing changes in neurochemistry or other uh, uh, molecular pathways which may help us guess or hypothesize how that animal's fitness, physiology, or behavior is being impacted. So here's just some basic data. Uh, on the x-axis are the brain regions uh, we study, and on the y-axis the amount of total mercury in the brain part per million. Um, this is just a representative uh, a slide from across brain regions of a harbor corpus. And, uh, uh, a couple of takeaways here is, uh, I, I guess the main takeaway is that there's tremendous variation across brain regions. So the brain is perhaps one of the most heterogeneous organs uh, inside the body. And when you take a step back and look at wildlife toxicology in general, uh, and you take a look at all the studies that have tried to look at the brain or study neurotoxicology in wildlife, they almost all study the brain as the brain. You get the brain of a fish, you get the brain of a bird and you homogenize that whole brain and ask your questions, but we think that that's not good enough. There's an opportunity to actually take that brain and break it down into regions that enable you to go a little bit deeper. Now, I know when I show this to neuroscience friends of mine, they laugh at me because this is still quite crude, but uh, the crowds that I usually go with think this is actually quite sophisticated, so <laughs> we'll take this. Um, but nonetheless, when we, when we look at the distribution of mercury across the brain regions. We see tremendous variation, so a tenfold difference in the means. Yes? Is the range among individuals or among locations in an individual or both? Yes, so the, this is from uh, I think nine or ten harbor corpuses, and each bar represents uh, that brain region value for each of those. Individual. So each bar is an inter individual variation for a single species. So you ground up the whole frontal cortex. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, when we cut out the frontal cortex, I'm not quite sure where the de de delineation is. So we go to the frontal cortex. We usually took about a one or two centimeter cubed area of frontal cortex. Do you know why you think regional differences in accumulation? Is it something about myelination or is it? We're not sure. Uh, I, I was initially thinking that for a chemical like mercury, it avidly binds to uh, thiols. So is there just differences in protein uh, composition across brain regions? There are other chemicals we've looked at that uh, settle preferentially in fats. Is there differences in fat composition? And I thought there would be, but the literature that I've seen suggests otherwise, that it seems quite stable across the brain. Uh, we haven't done that sophisticated, I mean, those detailed analyses in these brains themselves. Uh, so I'm, I'm not quite sure yet why. So that's across brain regions for one species. It's somewhat similar across all the other species. One thing to, to note though, however, is when you look at the regions that have more accumulation versus less accumulation, it follows a pattern where you have things like the brain stem, the cerebellum, sort of these lower brain structures of less mercury in them than the more um, uh, more developed brain regions, sort of in the, in the frontal regions of the brain. So that's one thing we did notice. And the pituitary has amongst the most, and maybe that's just its location as a as sort of the mediator between the body and the brain. It's innervated with more blood too. Um, now, anytime you study mercury, you have to realize that mercury has a number of chemical forms. And if you recall what I said earlier, that the speciation of mercury really matters. So I presented data on total mercury earlier, but for all of our work, we look at mercury as methylmercury, the inorganic forms, and total mercury. And in this case, we see that most of the mercury in the brain is that methylmercury form. But in the pituitary, we see that uh, most of it's inorganic mercury.
and uh, that's interesting too. Uh, without getting into too much detail, uh, in observations of mercury poisoning both in humans and wildlife, the latency between exposure and disease can be on the orders of years. So if you're exposed to a lot of methylmercury now for the next few months, you're not going to keel over and die immediately. It's going to happen decades later. And one of the hypotheses has been is that that methylmercury form is the one that can easily get into the organism. It can easily get past the blood-brain barrier. But when you look at cellular data, when you look at in vitro data, where you can actually manipulate exposure to different types of mercury, find the methylmercury form is toxic, but actually the inorganic form is much more toxic. So there's been this belief that the methylmercury form is simply a vehicle to get that mercury into the brain. And then slowly over time, that methyl form gets demethylated into an inorganic form. And in fact, it's the inorganic form that's more reactive, which eventually causes toxicity. So we have data from a number of other wildlife to actually show that uh, there is quite a big variation in an organism's ability to demethylate mercury in the brain. So here are the results uh, across the brain regions. And uh, I don't remember what brain region this is. I think I chose the frontal cortex. Uh, on the y-axis is the total mercury value in the brain regions. And again, it's on a log of transform scale. And one thing we do notice is that just like across brain regions, across the species, that there can be tremendous variation in the amounts in the brain. So as a quick summary, uh, what this work thus far has shown is that across species, <coughs> there can be great variation, relatively low in the ring seals and the polar bears, and much higher in the whales. If you look at the liver samples in all these species, they're relatively the same. They're high. All of these animals have high levels of mercury in their liver. So we think they're all, I mean, they're, they're, there are differences in trophic position, but by and large, they're at the top, and they're taking in a fair bit of mercury. And we see that from the liver data and also the blood data. So they have a fair bit of mercury that they're being exposed to. But when we look in the brain, we see that there are differences. So some of the ideas we've been toying around with is that maybe the blood-brain barrier is different in each one that may limit or enhance exposures. Uh, there might be differences in biotransformation or metabolism capacity in these animals, either outside of the brain or even within the brain. And then fur keeps on coming up. Because if you look at the animals that have lower amounts of mercury, so the seals and the polar bears, they have fur. And in mammals in general, fur represents an amazing route of uh, excretion. That for us, we use hair as a way to gauge exposures to mercury. And then these organisms, they use fur. And there's a fair amount of mercury that gets excreted through fur. Maybe the, uh, the whales just don't touch us. So these are some of the things that we're trying to uh, explore a little bit further. Uh, within the brain, we see variation, and coming back to the question earlier, I'm not quite sure why, but we do see regional differences, and that's something we'd like to further pursue. And again, these things that we haven't done yet, if there are students that want to do this, we have all the samples, so feel free to talk to me. Uh, we're always interested in this difference between organic mercury and inorganic mercury, and uh, how that can help explain sensitivity. And then, the big question is that, okay, fine, we see these animals, they have a fair bit of mercury that they're being exposed to. Some of them have more in their brain than others. Are these exposures being related to any kind of subclinical change that means anything? So moving on to this. Uh, this is a scatter plot relating brain mercury concentrations <coughs> on the x-axis. And this is in the, uh, the lower brainstem region of polar bears with uh, the number of NMDA receptors. So this is a major receptor in the brain for glutamine. Um, and what we see here is a negative correlation. It's not the strongest relationship, it is significant, it's negative. What makes this data a little bit more exciting is that we've seen a very similar observation, actually much, much stronger in mink, in river otter, in common loons, in bald eagles. We see this relationship in a number of wildlife from other parts, from the Great Lakes in this case, in which high exposures to mercury 
are associated with reduced NMDA receptor levels. And the thinking, and, and again, some of this has been shown in the biomedical literature too. And the thinking is that mercury may be viewed as, I mean, it exerts its toxicity because it binds protein thiols, and because of that oxidative stress keeps on uh, emerging to be an important uh, uh, pathway in, this, in, in uh, its toxicity. But it's also been shown to cause excitotoxic responses, so causing elevations of glutamate in the synapse, which causes uh, excitability in the brain. And one way to minimize that uh, uh, excitability is to reduce the number of NMDA receptors. And again, we just have a number of uh, studies from various wildlife showing this uh, correlative associative evidence. And when you look at the rodent literature, it shows something similar. And in fact, we have some data that we published a couple years ago on feeding studies in which we fed mink methyl mercury that we saw this too. So we, we actually believe that this is real. And we see it in the polar bears too. You see it in other parts of the brain too or just the brain stems? In this study we just had the brain stem and we just saw it in the brain stem. Uh, the studies that I described earlier in which we had those six uh, arctic green mammals, for each of those we looked at the NMDA receptor but also the GABA receptor, the dopamine receptor, uh, in each of the brain regions across all six species. So we had, I think, seven or eight cases we were looking at per uh, species. And it was messy. I, I, I just think when you do these types of uh, ecological studies, that there are just so many factors coming into play here. If your sample sizes are not hard enough, and if you can't control enough variables, it's hard to distill anything from it. So in that case, we were hoping that we would see something, but th there was nothing consistent. I think the only reason we're seeing it here is that the sample size in this cohort was 82. A couple of years ago, we also published a paper looking at global DNA methylation in the brainstem of those polar bears, too. And we saw uh, an exposure related decrease uh, in the males only, but not females. Now, the reason we did this is because there's just been a lot of hubbub about epigenetics in the last few years. And when I was at Michigan, I was, I was <coughs> surrounded by all these labs that have these great tools to look at CPG methylation. And they were really excited at the possibility of trying these assays on wildlife. So we collaborated on a project and, went, and this was the outcome of it. Um, I don't really know what to think about this too, too much, except that there's an association. Uh, we have seen it in other organisms. And uh, the, the one caveat to this is that this is global DNA methylation using one type of assay. And it just does not have the, uh, the depth that you would want. So we're not looking at individual CPG sites and individual genes. Uh, it's really just a global snapshot of the methylation status. And it's really hard to actually take away anything from this. But nonetheless, uh, it's something that we're still interested in doing more in wildlife. And in fact, we're doing more on human projects that I'll describe later to you because there are now tools in which you can interrogate specific CPG sites and specific genes. But nonetheless, I, I, I think there are some things we could do in the future uh, using some of the epigenetic tools uh, that we've been using for human health and applying them to uh, uh, wildlife health. And this is just an example of one from a few years ago. So, uh, to summarize the mercury uh, effects work, from our group we've been able to show in some cases that there are changes in brain neurochemistry that may be associated with mercury exposure. We've seen some very crude changes in epigenetics. These are all things we do want to follow up into the future. Uh, my colleagues have shown other things. Uh, there's been a consistent pattern of uh, uh, lesions found in the brain, uh, in the in the liver, and the kidneys of a number of Arctic marine mammals in relation to contaminant exposure. Uh, there have been a number of studies published showing that organochlorine, so PCBs and related compounds, uh, exposure to those being associated with alterations in thyroid hormone. Uh, and there have been a number of studies also showing changes in bone density in these bears, which should be expected uh, just given what these chemicals do. So when you look at the weight of evidence, and we've been able to write a few papers on this that have brought together the various players, um, this is all principally taken from correlated work, so you have to understand the caveats of doing ecological studies and all the covariates that might be at play. But again, when you take a broad view of the evidence, realize that it's coming from different species, in different parts of the world, by different laboratories, and they're coming up with similar conclusions. Uh, the weight of evidence tells us that there is something going on. 
And then when you add on top of that the fact that these animals, beyond the stress they feel from contaminants, that they're being stressed by uh, human development, they're being stressed by changes in the environment such as climate, uh, that it makes you wonder how healthy they really are. So we, we never think that contaminants are the number one threat to these bears, but rather we need to wonder, and many of us do, that do these chemicals, and exposure to these chemicals, reduce the bear's ability to cope with other stressors. So I want to briefly talk about the human health work. Because again, it's the human communities in the Arctic that live off these animals. They rely upon the animals for livelihood, they rely upon the animals for a source of food and sustenance. And this is a figure taken from the AMAP report, so AMAP standing for Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Uh, this is a circumpolar organization which is geared towards bringing together the six, seven circumpolar countries to uh, better understand the status of the pole. And this is data um, on mercury exposure from Inuit populations from Canada and Greenland. And uh, what the data show us is that a sizable proportion of Inuit sampled from across the circumpolar region, or sorry, from Canada and uh, Greenland, have levels of mercury in their body that are higher than guideline values. Now over time things have started to come down, but nonetheless, these are exposures that are 10, 50, 100 times greater than what people experience down here in the global south. Uh, there are tremendous exposures to mercury in the Arctic. And uh, again, uh, I haven't done that much work in the Arctic, but the times that I've been there, and especially that one time where I ate a couple of meals of traditional country food, were enough to drastically increase my exposures. So if you're there living day in and day out, it's not surprising that your exposures to contaminants like mercury are high. So, as a result, there's been a lot of work done in the Arctic to understand what this means for the health of people. Uh, now again, contaminants are just one factor. Uh, there's a great dietary transition going on too, there's urban development, uh, there are some social factors too. So, health in general in the Arctic is a problem. And to address these health issues, there was a large survey done in 2007 and 2008. That was actually